May 25, 1978. Terry Marker suffered minor injuries from a parcel bomb left in the parking lot of Northwestern University. May 9, 1979. John Harris suffered burn wounds and cuts to the face from a bomb in a cigar box left on his desk in his Northwestern University office. November 15, 1979. American Airlines flight number 444 withstood a partial detonation of a parcel bomb en route from Chicago to Washington. June 10, 1980. Percy Wood suffered major injuries to his face and hands from opening the book Ice Brothers by Sloan Wilson, which housed an explosive May 5, 1982. Janet Smith suffered injuries to her chest, arms, and hands after opening Second, 1982. Diogenes Angeleco suffered major injuries in 1987. Gary Ryan, son of the owner of Cam's Computer Store, suffered major injuries, injuries after lifting the parcel bomb left in the parking lot of Cam's Computer Store. The series nerve damage to his arm. The series of parcel bombs that detonated between May 25, 1978 to April 24, 1995 formed one of the longest and most enigmatic FBI investigations in its history. The incontrovertible evidence that would eventually lead to the Unabomber's conviction is credited to this cardinal instance of forensic linguistics. The use of language as legally incriminating evidence was unprecedented until 1996, when David Kaczynski read a published manifesto by the Unabomber. The similarities between it and the writings of his brother, Ted, were irrefutable. On February 23, 1996, the Unabom Task Force concurred when Dave sent them Ted's 23-page fundamental draft of the manifesto. This point marked the first instance that forensic linguist comparisons were consolidated to form sufficient evidence for a probable cause affidavit for a search warrant. Dr. Charles Epstein was badly injured in his kitchen in Sacramento, California. He was the head of genetics department at the University of California Medical School. On June 24th, Dr. David Glerdner was badly injured in his Yale office in New Haven, Connecticut. The thread between these two injuries signified a resurgence of a nationwide trepidation, and one police sketch reappeared in the psyches of Americans. This police sketch came from the only eyewitness of the Unabomber. Seven years with no mention, no leads, and no bombs had caused many to believe that he had either died or been arrested. Attorney General Janet Reno, the Secretary of Treasury Lord Benson, and the Postmaster General Marvin Travis Runyon ordered the creation of the Unabomb Task Force on June 27, 1993. Before long, the UTF was fully operational within its headquarters at the FBI office in Sacramento, California, and being run by Chief Inspector George Clow, and later by SAC Jim Freeman and SAC Terry Churchy. Projects were formed trailing all suspicions that the UTF had about its top 10 suspects. The foremost project was the Nathan R. Project, which relied on a faint indentation of writing on the letter which read, Call Nathan R. 7 p.m. It was indented by writing on a paper on top of the letter. There were nine projects in total being staffed by various members of the ATF, USPIS, and the FBI. Fifteen years was more or less unprecedented for a terrorist case by that point. It was clear that the FBI was being held back by its own bureaucratic processes. The Unabom case required a change in strategy. The initiator of this change came from a letter sent to the San Francisco Examiner in December of 1985. It stated that the bombs were acts of terrorism from a group that called themselves Freedom Club. It followed the December 11th murder of Hugh Scruton. It wasn't until after the Unabomber's hiatus that he would write his next letter on June 24, 1993, which was a letter to Warren Hodge, an editor of the New York Times. Similar to the last, it gave details about the FCI identifier, as well as a social security number that could prevent fraudulent writings. He would go on to send 12 more letters under this FC label. The FBI never gave the letters a complacent treatment. Whether the letter was a threat to blow up a major airliner or a threat for an obscure geneticist to stop his practice, these letters did not fall on deaf ears. This would especially be the case on June 20, 1995, when another letter was sent to Warren Hodge. The letter starts like most, taking responsibility for the bombs that preceded it to maintain credibility. We have a long article between 29,000 and 37,000 words that we want to have published. If you can get it published according to their requirements, we will permanently desist from terrorist activities. On June 28, 1995, FC's article was sent to Warren Hodge of the New York Times, as well as the Washington Post, Penthouse Magazine, and The Earth First. The Industrial Society and its future was a Unabomber's manifesto detailing the strong encouragement of reform for post-industrial revolution in America. James R. Fitzgerald was a recent graduate of the Intensive Behavioral Analysis Training Program at the Academy and was quick to express his belief in the potential of the Unabomber's writings within the case to SAC Jim Freeman. Fitzgerald was appointed to investigate the documents in the case. If the manifesto wasn't published, the resulting blood would be on the hands of the FBI and the news organization. If it was published, then a precedent would be set that the FBI complied with terrorists. The hope was that someone would read the manifesto and be able to associate it with someone who had matching beliefs. 
We have all agreed to recommend against promoting the publication of the manifesto and giving in to the demands of a terrorist. Terry Turchi, the SSA tasked with writing and written position, felt uneasy when confronted with the other agents in his office that evening. The stance was reversed. Terry wrote this revised position statement several hours later, and it was determined that the FBI did recommend publishing the manifesto. The Unabomber's manifesto was published on September 19, 1995 by the Washington Post. The UTF would amass a suspect list of 2,417. College professor Linda Patrick had raised the discussion with her husband, David Kaczynski, about articles within their local newspaper about the Unabom profile in the summer of 1995. It was only a matter of time before she made the connection to the philosophies of David's estranged brother, Theodore Kaczynski. To his brother, Ted Kaczynski was a role model. What he lacked in sociability, he made up for in genius. With a scholarship at 16, he earned a bachelor's degree in mathematics at Harvard University. He earned a Ph.D. in mathematics at the University of Michigan. He is a former professor of mathematics at the University of California, Berkeley. When Ted came to David with the idea of purchasing land in Lincoln, Montana and building a 10 by 14 foot cabin, David was proud of Ted for following his dreams. None of these events could have allowed David to entertain Linda's suspicion that Ted was the Unabomber. All of that changed when David and Linda read a copy of the manifesto on February 20th, 1995 on the FBI's website. The similarities were too visible to remain complacent. Trying to affirm whether the suspicion was justified, David and Linda hired a private investigator, Susan Swanson, to analyze this likelihood. Before long, it became clear that the geographic connections and the ideological similarities and the vernacular parallels between the letters were enough reason to take action. James Fitzgerald's temporary duty with the Unabom Task Force ended in mid-December 1995. However, it wasn't long before he received a call from Turchi on February 23, 1996, requesting that he review a 23-page document and compare it to the manifesto. The document was one that David found while visiting his sick mother back at his and Ted's childhood home in Evergreen Park, Chicago. Upon reading this manuscript, Fitzgerald was fully convinced that this document was written by the Unabomber. Within the same phone call, plans were arranged for Fitzgerald to return to the Unabomb Task Force. In the meeting with some of his former UTF counterparts, it was determined that he would head the new Comparative Analysis Project, which would compare the language of the Unabomber's 14 letters against a series of 175 writings found in Ted Kaczynski's former home. The ultimate goal was to form the comparisons and word pairings into a probable cause affidavit to search Ted's cabin in Lincoln. Forensic linguistics was no longer a constituent in making this affidavit. It was the cornerstone. By April 2nd, the affidavit was written. Fifty pages, packed with over 600 linguistic comparisons and circumstantial evidence, comprised the document. April 3rd, 1996. SSRA Tom McDaniel, who was recruited to coordinate FBI operations in Lincoln, arrived with Special Agent Max Noel and Forest Service police officer named Jerry Burns. After surveying the cabin, the three men walked towards the front door. They knocked on the door saying that they were from the Nordic Drilling Company, requesting to see the corner stakes of his property. As Ted went to get his coat, he was pulled out of his cabin by Jerry Burns and detained on the ground. A flood of incriminating evidence was waiting for them in that 10 by 13 cabin. Not even his lawyers could offend him against these documents when his trial occurred on June 16, 1996. Each of them had their own justifications for their desired outcomes. His lawyers were intent on fulfilling their duty of minimizing Ted's punishment as much as possible. His brother was concerned with doing what he could to help Ted avoid the death penalty. Ted was concerned with upholding the status of his mental state as to not discredit his ideas. The tactics of David Kaczynski and Ted's lawyers did just the opposite. Ted was examined by psychiatrist Sally Johnson who diagnosed him with paranoid schizophrenia. The examination was an effort for the jury to decide against the death penalty. Nonetheless, Ted would have no part in it, and after a denied attempt to represent himself from that point forward, pled guilty to his three charges of murder and 13 accounts of transporting explosive devices with the intent to kill or maim on January 22, 1998. The Unabom case was one that was filled with firsts, ranging from its incredible length of 18 years to its groundbreaking use of language as evidence. The work done by the comparative analysis team at the UTF set legal precedents in the U.S. that language analysis, text analysis, and forensic linguistics was an acceptable scientific principle. Since the Unabom case, forensic linguistics has become its own field of investigation and is used by investigators in the realm of profiling. As the ease of sharing information grows, forensic linguistics has shown to maintain its immense utility within recent and future criminal cases. 
Each instance owes its legal viability to one probable cause affidavit.